really grateful to, to be here and share my thinking and my work with all of you, um, both at U of H and at Rice. Um, should I just get started? Yeah, yeah, exactly. If you want to just uh, talk to us about what you're working on now. Okay, so um, I, as I, I'm going to take my phone off of this little stand, so it might get a little awkward. Um, I'm trying not to, let me just actually take that. I don't know, that won't work. Okay, sorry. Um, so I sort of heard you all talking when I um, originally got on before Natasha's class joined us. And I, I like that there was this conversation about um, my earlier series of work and um, questioning what kind of material I work with and um, something about sculpture. And um, I like that there's this kind of um, place that I can sort of definitively tell you all that um, I just got a little, the host has spotlighted your video for everyone. Yes. Okay, that's fine. Yes. Um, so I, I like to just come into to the, that space and definitively say, I am a painter, I'm a painter. Um, and um, I love painting. Um, I think of drawing and painting as very related to each other, like basically the same thing. I've often been told that my paintings are like drawings or I draw, I paint like, a draw, like I'm drawing and I draw like I'm painting. And so they're very fluidly involved with each other. Of course, drawing is, a, is different than painting only in the sense that it's a much um, more, uh, it, it's, it doesn't stay wet as I work. So I can really um, layer and layer and layer on top as I'm working. Whereas with oil paint, while I can do that, it, um, it takes much longer to build uh, and I have to wait for things to settle um, it gets a little messy if I try to do too much, and so I have to leave it at certain points. Um, so, but they, but they are very much the same thing. And even the site-specific work that I had done um, in previous years was always based in painting. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm very, very much a painter. I, my, my, my entry into being an artist is actually, you know, completely through a love of painting. And an astonishment and an enchantment with painting and how it accomplishes what it does, which is um, to present something to us that sort of switches on something inside of us that like kind of makes our feet come off the ground a little bit um, and gives us a sense of um, wonder and even, even something a little bit like a, um, a change of mind or a change of, of how we view the world. Um, but I'll talk about that more, maybe. Um, so maybe I should take you around a little bit and show you that what I'm working on, let me flip this, right, to, can I do that? Yes. No, I can't. Yes, I can. Is that working for you guys? Yeah, hold do you on. see the um, spotlight? There back. we go, okay. There we go. So, um, oh no, now it's showing you. Ugh. Okay, sorry. Well, I spotlighted there we go. the video, your phone. Okay, great. Sorry, this takes a minute to just adjust to the different screens. Um, so for the past 10 years, um, since 2010, I have been working as a, basically a still life painter. Um, I was always working abstractly Sometimes I used photographs, those fence images that you saw were, fo fo were um, on, my, on my website were paintings and drawings that I made based off of photographs that I took. Um, but at a certain point, I, even with that, I was sort of working intuitively and abstractly. And there was one day 10 years ago or so that I was sitting in my studio and I was inventing something like a cage-like space out of my head and working with gouache, which is a kind of watercolor, an opaque watercolor, and just in um, with a black watercolor and dipping into the paint and um, building this thing in a, in a kind of just a spontaneous level of lights and darks with the dark, with the black paint, the black gouache. Um, and I started thinking, well, wait a minute, why aren't I trying to use, you know, I'm trying to create this four, 
this two this three dimensional four sided cage space and why don't i try to render light you know and actually try to create a sense of volume through rendering tone and um out of my head i didn't know how to do that and so i created picked up some paper in my studio laid it on top of um, a box that i had in the studio grabbed some scotch tape and i scotch taped together a um a paper box that i just then sat on my studio table and started trying to observe how light fell on it to create a sense of um of depth and space and that um that paper box that little tangent and trying to present for myself some sort of truth in, in how you render volume in two-dimensional space became um a now 10-year ongoing body of work um, and what you can see here i think yeah is a kind of very transparent version of of a box and you can see this one has slatted um slatted sides can you guys see that yes okay um that is you know 10 years down the road that is a version of of that box i can also come over here you can come through my studio with me and i'm going to look for um my box of where are they oh here they are okay now you're really in the studio with me you guys this is perfect. Um, great and I'll go to this little area that's actually got some stuff set up, but I have light here that you can see. Um, they're really crumpled up, but you can see, I don't, I don't know if, if I, oh, I do. I still have one of the paper ones, right? Like so falling apart, but you see, right? Like what it, what it is, like this crappy thing, <laughs> this crappy thing that was just started as an experiment or or a kind of um decision to to use the um the characteristics or the the facts and the specifics of real life to um render an abstraction on paper or on canvas and by abstraction i mean that we are um you're, you're, you're trying to materialize something inside the space of a canvas that doesn't, that isn't really there, right? It's, it's this whole virtual thing, like what we're doing right now. Um, so this is sort of the place where the work began. Um, and I can show you many images when I, if you'd like for me to do a, a kind of share of the work that I've done over the years, but at the moment this is what the setup looks like um with introducing the box the box went from being this paper box to becoming something that was transparent um, and i studied just the box itself for many many years um not even trying to indicate the tape on it but literally just trying to render the sides of it to sort of talk about it as this container of of a volume um, and really where it comes from is, um, I want to switch this to, to be talking myself, but really where it comes from is, um, this, this question about, I've, I've always been trying to understand how content, a sense of content and meaning has, um, can, can be created in the space of a painting. You know, why is it that it kind of, some paintings kind of start to lift us off our feet a little bit. Um, why do we stand in front of um, a beautiful Renaissance painting and feel like, oh my God, how did they do this? How does he render that piece of, you know, the fur around her, her collar? Um, or we stand in front of a, a Mark Rothko and it's completely abstract, but it feels like it's taking us to another plane. And so I've always sort of believed in that at the same time as not believed in it as a condition of being um, an artist coming of age in the 90s. Um, and just in the moment of history where we're in, where we're no longer like purely romantic and uh, believing, you know, um, there's always doubt, right? That's we're always thinking about how something is made and trying to get into 
a conversation about why interrogating why something happens this way, what's what's underneath it. So my my whole investigation in my career has been how does content get made, and um, some point along the line, I realized I looked in the dictionary and content is defined as that which is contained, and. I started realizing that I'm not so much interested in defining content and in, in producing a meaning that can be defined, but I'm kind of more interested in pointing to the fact that there's this possibility. There's always this possibility within that space of a painting, as well as in the space of painting as a with a capital P, to um, it's a, it's a, it's a space that has a potential. It's a surface and it's also a depth. There's also something that goes on inside of it. And so the box became kind of a surrogate for that space inside of painting. It's a five-sided box, meaning that its top is open, just like the, we, we have a, a surface of open to, to us in a painting. Um, and um, it's sort of, in my earliest paintings, it was one-to-one -one way that I was drawing the box in relationship to the size of the canvas. So in the past 10 years, there's about 100 pieces in this series. And I, and I think of it, you know, seriality is also a strategy for painting in the sense of accumulation, that you accumulate um, attempts at the same thing over and over again. And that accumulation kind of accumulates or accrues into something that convinces you that you're doing something meaningful, right? It convinces you and it convinces others that um, that that evidence of a kind of um, um, tenacity, persistence, um, commitment, devotion. When you make a series and repeat something and accumulate something, it starts to become something that has a meaningfulness. And I distinguish between meaning and meaningfulness again, like the. The container and the or that which is contained and the content, and that meaningfulness is uh, a kind of filled with meaning. It's it's a it's um it's not about meaning. It's about feeling something to be filled with meaning. Again, that meaning is not my my job. My job t for me is to think about how meaning how this place gets filled with meaning and, and how that, that works. Um, let me reverse this again to show you. Um, so these are recent works. What? Um, the paintings, so they're oil paintings. They're 12 inch, this one is 12 inches by 12 inches. All of the work is really intimately scaled. So for 10 years I have not worked larger than um, I think 12 by 16, maybe, I think I've done, done two that were 14 by 18. Um, and these are, the, the paintings that are on my wall um, are finished, these are finished works. I work on one piece at a time. Um, these paintings that you're looking at, this is the most recent painting. They, they take about six months of work. And I'll go in close. This is translating, right? Yes, it's great, Shoshana. Okay. And what you see is this kind of, I like to think of it, especially these, these two here, um, going back to this one, you know, one of the things that, so, so the work is really based on something very, very traditional, very academic and very, um, yeah, conventional. It's, still life observation. So I'm sitting with this, this setup, whether it's just the box as it was in the beginning, not even looking at the tape, um, or where it's been now and 10 years later with like this uh, arrangement posed so that the box itself is now surrounded by another kind of box of mirrors, differently shaped mirrors. And there's reflective surfaces around that. And there's reflective tape around, you know, holding it all together. Um, but my nose is, like my face is directly in this thing. So I'm not across the room. The setup is sitting on my studio table. My little painting is right in front of it. My nose is right there. My eyes are, are inches away from this thing. And so one of the things that happens is that each of our eyes, we, we're binocular and 
contrary to the um, propaganda of linear perspective, um, we don't see from one single point. We see from two different eyes and they register space differently in relationship to um, how close things are to it. So I will be working and working and it's going great and I'm just loving it. And I get to a place where I've put something down looking through my right eye and now I'm looking elsewhere in the setup and my left eye is seeing that um, where I initially put it down doesn't make sense, right? The, the distance between things changes from um, one eye to another. And there is this, this, this um, impossibility, our brain is the only, our brain takes the information that we see from both eyes and it cognitively makes up a reality for us, right? So one of the things that this work deals with is um, holding multiple realities, multiple visual realities, and sort of tolerating that they can never be resolved. Um, that there is no such, there is no one reality, there is no one truth. It's all subjective. It's all abstraction. Um, and another thing that happens is that I, even working within the course of a day, the light is different in the morning than it is in the afternoon. My point of view, even though I sit down every day and reset myself in the right position to see from the same position, the same viewpoint, something has definitely changed, right? Like dust settles, the light changes. It's, I started it in September and then it's January. I've changed somehow as I'm making it. So there's this kind of cacophony of information. And this painting that we're looking at um, is really what it looked like. Like there's nothing made up at all, but it is, even in its making up or even in the way that I, that I set it up, I was really drawn to um, the, the mirror has a kind of beveled edge that duplicates the reflection of this piece of tape, right? So there's this kind of chop, chop, chop that reminded me of cubism and futurism. And um, all the colors are what I had in front of me, right? Like it's not, nothing is invented. Um, just going to this painting, um, this is a painting that I very, I'm sorry, my, my walls are a little bit unstraight, um, that I actually staged the, the setup to respond or to the, the setup, the way that I arranged the mirrors in the box was in response to a Piero della Francesca painting called Madonna of Mercy. That is a beautiful painting that I've um, had the great luck of visiting many, many times in Tuscany in Italy, where I have good friends who um, bring me to these places. And when I would visit this painting and, and many like it, I really was thinking about how my pilgrimage to these paintings is aligning with the pilgrimage of believers in what the painting is presented, which is the, this, the narrative of Christianity, of Jesus, of Mary. Um, my pilgrimage to the painting is like an equivalent to their pilgrimage to see the contents that the painting gave them, the story, this, this, um, the sense of having something to believe in, a sense of meaningfulness. And so I staged the, painting or the, the setup for my painting in the site, S-I-T-E, so to speak, of this Piero della Francesca. And I can show you images later, if we get to it, um, that you can really see my thinking in um, when you compare the Piero compositionally and this painting and as well as this setup. So more recently, I was working, uh, so hard to see these, was working on um, a series of drawings. This is a drawing, more drawing. This is on a kind of paper that is called Yupo paper. Oops, now my phone is on low battery, which means I should plug it in, hold on. <laughs> should have seen that coming. Um, maybe this is a moment for questions actually right. and or showing um you know doing a screen share um let's see what kind of paper 
Did you okay, so it's um. Let me let me do the screen share real quick because they look better this way anyway, and then we can go back into the physical um, space. Um. So, and of course, these drawings are. This is an example of one of those drawings. You guys can see that. Yeah. Um. And Shoshana, what are these materials? Is it graphite only, or is right. there? So this is this is graphite on a type of paper called Yupo paper. And um, let me see if I can grab. This is a large pad of it that you can see. Mm, actually, we can't see. We can't. <laughs> or, or hold on, I think I need. Wait, to let me. Because let me you're screen sharing, we can only see the drawing. Yeah. That's funny. So now. My iPhone is being like my. All right, I'll um. How about I'll, this? I'll I'll stop your sharing and then you can show us. I can do it. Do you want me to do that? Um, sure. I mean, it's just a uh, it's called the UFO paper and it's a translucent. Let's see now. Nope. You see it now? Yes. That's just what it is. And of course, it's probably reversed. No. Um, it's not. Okay. So it's, um, it's a very smooth, this is a larger, larger pot of it in the sense of um, I use much small, um, the ones that I just showed, was showing you is a much smaller five by seven, but it's translucent. Mm -hmm. And um, oh God, somebody's calling me. <laughs> <laughs> my phone. Um, it's translucent. It's very um, slick, slippery even. It is completely non-absorbent. So when you work with water-based materials, it's, um, um, it doesn't absorb it. Um, so I started using it years ago when I would be traveling and wanting to use something to resist all the detail that I make with my, when I was working with watercolor or ink. And, you know, I think you can get a sense that I, I like, I've been doing this for so long and I want to keep challenging myself. And as soon as I feel like I'm in a comfort zone, I, I need to set up a resistance and make it harder for myself. And I think that's part of the, 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 the big interest in this is that it's, it's constantly a state where I believe and I'm yearning and I'm working and I'm keeping on, keep, I'm keeping on going even knowing that there's going to be a failure because the image can't resolve itself between my two eyes. Things are always changing, falling apart. Um, it's taped together. It's really fragile. It's all reflections. Um, so um, the Yupo paper is very active and slippery and I use these, these are drawings with pencil, um, all sorts of the whole range of um, these blue Stadler uh, Lumograph pencils. Um, and I work very similarly, you know, when I'm working with my pencils and I'm drawing or I'm working on a painting, this is what my, um, my brushes look like, right? So they're tiny and I'm accumulating um, marks and layering and layering and building up richness, richnesses and, um, and depths. I wanna see if I can share again for a sec. Sure. Um, no, I seem to have lost. I'm very confused at the moment of where my toolbar is. Oh, there it is. Okay, sorry. Okay, share screen. Yeah, I'm spotlighting your, there we go. All right, so I'll just run back for a second and flip through this because it'll give you guys more of a, We'll get it out of the way and then I can answer questions more. So this is just a shot from a studio setup of um, a selection of, of paintings. Um, so you can see that there's quite a few of them. Wait, um, are these in black and white or the photos black and white? The photos in black and white. Okay. okay. Why is it not moving? Okay. This is to show an early drawing. 
So this is just pencil on paper and you can maybe get a sense of it being white paper. Um, and really this, this idea of trying to understand value falling across this white box, this white paper box, um, to create a sense of inner volume and, and depth. Um, and you can see that there, there are these you know, white spaces. You can see my cursor, I think, right? Yes. You can see these white spaces. There's, in reality, there was tape here, but I just, I couldn't, I had to just even ignore the tape. There was so much that I was taking in that I didn't even um, attend to the tape yet. But you can see also that the scale of my drawing is the scale of the, of the full page of the paper. Um, so there was this one-to-one -one between the box of space, the boxes of volume that was um, in relationship to the volume or the size of the painting. This is a painting and you can see here, right? Like the way that I apply, um, these are little, I don't know if I can zoom in here, but these little brush strokes are like the equivalent of little pen pencil marks. It's how I build up, literally I'm building up value, right? So I might start with a very um, thin wash of the purple and then I'm building it up with more and more layers of that same paint and color and pigment to um, build up different values. Another example, right, where you can really see that it's very similar to the way that I was drawing at the time um, in building up um, a density, a richness where it was, um, where value changed. But now I'm starting also to show um, this kind of box around the box, which has to do with, you know, putting up pieces of foam pour or other types of paper to try to, you know, um, control what I was seeing. But it actually was about a box within a box and just this whole box thing was surrounding itself. This is very similar to the orange box that I showed you before. Um, but I actually made this in orange after I made that drawing. So I was still in a place where I was inventing color and in the sense of not being faithful to what I was seeing in front of me because what I was seeing in front of me had no color. Um, and here's an example of um, one of the setups. Um, so at the moment now, I, I kind of change, rearrange, repose, um, mm not quite every painting, not quite every six months, but um, I always have done multiple works from one setup. And literally, I'm in a new studio now that I moved into in the spring, but this box, you can see some string here, this box was hanging in, on, from my, my ceiling right over my table where I work for years, and I was generating paintings from it. So this is a painting that was generated from that one, um, and it uses gold, um, again, in response to those gold paintings of the Renaissance um, and gold being the signifier of, an, of incredible, supernatural, important meaning and, and bringing that into the site of my own painting. Um, these are just more examples of the same, you know, again, using this, this box sitting in front of my eyes, all being generated from that one setup. Um, this is probably the most literal of all my paintings, the one that looks the most realistic. Um, just to show you another example of a setup painting. Here's my family of mirrors. <laughs> I have more than just that. Um, and then this is getting into more recent work. And you can see here um, what I, well, what I did is I, I set up a whole situation where I had one mirror looking at another mirror. And the, they were, it was my idea of a selfie. I wanted to investigate what the box itself would be seeing. And so in order to do that, you know, I have to set up this whole box outside of the thing so that it doesn't see me looking in the box. I just wanted to see the box looking into a mirror. And as you can see here, there's, you know, what my left eye was seeing and the contradiction of what my right eye was seeing. And then, you know, just a little bit of, of the very hazy, you know, um, space that you, when you sort of are switching between two eyes, um, this intermediate space. And I, I want to just go back for a second into uh, this painting where you can see um, 
that there are these ghost, ghosted kind of images here. I actually did this painting with, at first I did it with my left eye closed, let it dry, and then I went back and drew in or painted in what my right eye saw. So it's literally like double vision. Um, Can I just say, wow. <laughs> <laughs> So just flipping through, these are more recent, and um, this one is called, I, I mean, they're all, they're all titled, the whole entire series is titled collectively um, Within, Without, and, but I have kind of subtitles. This one is called Binocular, because I, in this one, you can see that there's a piece of tape right here that is um, joining one of these little square mirrors with another little square mirror. <laughs> Somewhat like, can you guys see this? Or no, because I'm sharing, you don't see it. Right. I'll, I'll show you that in a minute. I'll get back into the real world. Um, but it's basically two uh, little squares of mirror that are not lined up with each other so that the, the, the slats of the box don't run continuous. So that each mirror sort of sees something a little bit off. Like you can see it here where this, this, uh, this is a, an oval mirror that should be, you know, if this was a solid piece of mirror, like it is here, it just shows a continuous image. But here, the two points of the mirror are overlapping. And so they don't, they don't resolve into a neat um, union, much like the way our, my eyes don't. Um, this is an example of a setup. Right, um, so you can kind of get a sense of that cacophony of seeing and why it would take me six months to um, attend to all of this. And you know that over six months, some of these tapes start to like change from humidity in the room or um, dust is falling or the light is changing. This is the painting you saw. And here's an example of um, the Piero della Francesca and the setup that I had at the painting, two more examples of that, right? So I was setting up those two flanking mirrors to be like the um, outstretched arms of um, Madonna of Mercy and the way that um, her arms are, you know, sort of stretching out to protect and cover her believers and her followers and she's a protector. And so it's really, again, like another kind of container in in, inside her arms. And it's a container that is um, all about believing, all about um, believing in something larger than yourself and hope. And um, again, using that as a site, S-I-T-E, for my own work. Um, and here's, we, go, we are in the, in the very, very recent, past or the almost the present. Um, this is a the setup that that drawing um, was based on. And as I was working, this was the summer and we had a lot of crazy stuff going on this summer. Um, and in particular, um, I was, you know, sort of taking my engagement with the history of Catholicism and this, this, uh, this yearning to believe and this believing this, this persistence of believing um, and always wanting to believe in something. And I, and I was sort of thinking about it in terms of the civil rights movement and the history of, um, history of civil rights, the history of the fight for um, the struggle for freedom uh, and the Black Lives Matter movement and this sort of aligning this ethics of resilience and this believing and having faith and doubt at the same time. And a friend of mine, um, suggested that I read this book, which is by um, James Coney. And so the image of, the, of Jesus on the cross being um, very, very empowering to um, civil rights leaders um, while being um, not seen by white theologians, you know, not seeing the relationship between the person lynched and the image of the cross. But I was reading this book and really reaching, trying to reach to understand so many, um, you know, brutal realities, but also, um, you know, the, the, the sort of makings of how people persist in believing in something, even when it's been, their, their belief is consistently rejected and destroyed. And I found that as I was making the drawing, 
um, even though I was paying attention to what was right in front of me directly and faithfully, I was building this image that was a, a cross, a Jesus, a crucifixion. And this image on the left is um, from a book of Fra Angelico, who is a early Renaissance Italian artist. And I had the book of his, uh, of, of his frescoes in my studio. I didn't really ever pay much attention to this particular image, but as I was, this is the drawing in progress, I could start to see that this, you know, um, horizontal bar of my box was taking on that. And there was this reflection that was starting here that felt like his arm. And then bizarrely that the, the way my tape was, was um, sort of spiraling also started to take on a lot of that, the, the, the sort of drape, so to speak, of his figure. Um, right, and you can see the final image there. Um, and I think this is, this is a work that I just finished, which is um, uh, a new direction of, of actually um, uh, not being faithful and um, not, not creating only one, the setup from one direction, but actually the setup that I showed you earlier, and I'll go back to it in real life, of, of um, basically like pulling together just moving clockwise, that's what I did, around the surface of the paper and continuing to draw the setup from different angles so that it becomes about, um, you know, it, it refers again to a kind of cubism and a kind of, um, there's this, this uh, quote about, from Plato about time, that time is the moving image of an unmoving eternity. And um, I think there's a lot about that compressed into this image. I'm going to stop my share and join the virtual real world with you guys. <laughs> and so just to, this is the, the two pieces of the wood, of the mirror that I was talking about. Um, I think I showed you this box earlier. Um, let's see if my phone has enough juice in it to be used again. I think it should. And just going back over to um, no, I have no, a quick question. So when you're when you're painting and drawing, you're just literally sitting at that table right there, like right. So um, yeah, I'm sitting. Here's my chair. I was really annoyed. Somebody was in my studio the other day and was I was having something sort of photographed in here. Uh, I was having an interview and she moved the chair and I was like, oh. God, you know, because I can put the chair back and find my way, but um, yeah. So I'm sitting, you know, I can't show it to you in the camera because, right, the camera sees something different than our eyes, but I'm, I'm seeing this part of it in a particular way, and, um, you know, I love that, and um, that's the drawing, or it's actually a, a painting on paper. Uh, on linen that's getting started. And it's very related to that last drawing that you just saw. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, that's you guys. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so how about uh, questions, anyone? I have a question. Yeah. Um, so obviously there's a lot of interaction between the objects and that's where most of the, you know, the reflections come from. But how often do you capture your own reflection in it? And with you, do you notice it? And then is it like really difficult because you don't want to like move your, I mean, obviously you're working in a small space, you don't have to move that much. But like, I imagine when you start to capture your own refre reflection and like every adjustment with your hand might alter the image. So yeah, yeah. That's a great question. Um, one of the things that, um, you know, I sort of was saying that in the beginning, um, I was ignoring, sorry, I just want to get a better view of you guys. Um, I was ignoring and editing out everything that I could to just focus on what, it, what I thought I wanted. And especially once I went into the transparent box, it totally showed my movement. I didn't know it at first. I was like, what is that weird, like, you know, um, 
very amorphous dark shape that I see on the back of the box. And I realized while I was working, oh my God, that's me. And it would change if I was wearing a dark shirt or a white shirt, you know? So these were the things that, that I learned along the way. Um, and I really had to quiet the, I didn't want to see myself. That wasn't what I was after. Um, and I wasn't capable of it. I was, I there was so much visual information, just that just trying to pay attention to the subtlety of the box itself was so much for me for so long. Um, and it was, um, I don't know if you remember this, the image that I was calling binocular, um, which was from about, uh, it's probably like five paintings ago, which is for me fairly recent. My reflection is in it, in the bottom of the, the, there's a, you can, if you really look, you can see that it's my skin tone and my eyebrows, right? Cause it's an inversion. So another thing that happens is because the, painting that I'm working on is also right there. As it gets developed, it starts to reflect in the box too. And so I've had paintings where, um, you know, I'm like, what's, what, why is that so different? And then I realized like a week later, oh, it's, it's different again because the painting is reflecting and the painting is being built. And I think that's an, you know, that's all in there, you know, and, and it's the reason, another reason why it's such a good question is because um, that's what sustains me to keep going because I, I feel like I get better and better at making that obvious to my viewer, right? So it's not just something that I have to point out and say, oh, the painting is in that painting, but that it, it's seen in that as well. Um, you know, it really, it really is a micro universe. It's, it's really ultimately, um, a space and a world that I've constructed and invented that keeps me on my, keeps me coming back. It's, um, um, it's totally enchanting to me and it's, it's my ground, it's my center. So in the way that, that Piero della Francesca, the way that that represents a kind of sanctuary for the followers, this setup and everything that it means is, is my sanctuary. You know, so it's, um, and that's where the accumulation thing also comes in, so the idea of seriality, that you, you start to do something. I mean, 10 years, you don't have to do something for 10 years, but it accumulates to convince you of its, of its, um, its realness, right? It's, it, that, it, that it is something substantial. Thank you for the question. I have a question. Nadia. Okay. I, Hey, uh, you did mention that you do paint in no larger than like 12 by 16. Do you think uh, painting in a larger scale would lose a meaning of what you're drawing or why is that? Um, well, I used to, thank you. I, I used to um, make huge paintings, really huge, like, uh, you know, taking up my whole um, studio space. And I was very interested in paintings, this, the fence images that are on my website. Um, which were, the, which was the body of work that preceded this one, um, was about creating these very large images that um, kind of surrounded, it, surrounded the viewer, right? Like sort of impacted your, it gave you kind of vertigo sometimes, standing in front of these images in real space. Um, I wanted to implicate the viewer in these chain linked spaces. Um, and, you know, so, they're they're connected that body of work of the fences it's the same thing as the box um you know it's it's surrounding and containing a space um there was a a, a number of things that happened which was the the biggest thing was that i really took a switch from being um making paintings out of a place of ego and making places out of a, a more modest humble place and a quieter place. And so I felt that big paintings are about ego. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm really, um, I'm invested in what Mirandi, Giorgio Mirandi's work was, this kind of very monastic, um, slow accumulation of, of work. And um, so that was an initial decision where I really wanted to scale down to something that was much more intimate 
And uh, I had already done that before I started this body of work, but because there's, it's so much about my being that close, that making a big painting would be, it wouldn't be, it, it just wouldn't, I'm not, it wouldn't be about being faithful to the piece. It would be about some other kind of, uh, some other kinds of um, message. I guess I think of scale. I love big paintings. Um, I do kind of miss the, the physicality of working with something really big and having to pick it up off the floor. Um, but I, I, I just, um, I really like building. I, these paintings are so, um, it's not that they look really thick, but that there, there's so many layers of paint. And one of the things I can um, bring my computer over to just show you my palette table. Um, you know, I paint, I make a medium with either linseed oil or some sort of oil and wax medium. And it becomes this little like liquid puddle. Um, on my palette and then I mix paint. And most of the time I'm painting in really translucent layers. So there's much more medium than there is actually paint in color. So the color gets built up through layers and layers of, of medium, of like a translucency. And um, it's, it's, it's only once it's built up like that, that it really feels like something has happened. Um, and part of it is, uh, is learning something from early experiences of standing in front of, a, of, a, of abstract paintings, again, like a Rothko, where there was this sense of, of depth and light uh, like behind the painting. And so you had this sense of, I had the sense of something larger was behind it. And, um, our eye, like light, we, we see things because light goes, travels through something, hits something and comes back. And so the, lar the more depth there is in the physical surface of the painting, the more they appear to be, have this depth. I don't think that would translate on a larger canvas. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> that explains a lot, thank you. Thank you. Were there other questions? I have a quick question, or did somebody just come in? Okay, I have a quick question, which is, um, Shoshana, how do you, the works that you have on the, on the studio wall, I'm imagining you might've just put those up like for our visit, but what's your working process in terms of finished works or like what, what goes on the wall when? Like, do you yeah. sometimes take the drawing or the painting that you're working on, like the one you have right now next to the setup, would you sometimes put that on the wall to look at it in a different way or, or not? What's, what's the ethics around that for you? Yeah, um, I mean, the studio is sort of um, set up right now um, because I had, a, had some studio visits and so it's more professionally installed. I mean, there's another wall of work mm. on that side. Um, I tend to not, like I go through phases of liking to have finished work around me, but in terms of um, uh, what my relationship is as I'm working on something, it goes up on the wall. And while, while I'm at the end of the day or when I come in in the day, so that I can see it, um, I tend to take I take photos every you know day um, or as it's developing, and I look at those at at home, and my family makes fun of me for like you know that I'm looking at my my work in progress, but they're like you know they're me they're they're, and it makes me think the question also makes me think of something very early on um, that I used to think about, which is that. At a certain point, I, um, when, when I've struggled in the studio, um, that I would, I would start to try to define or think about what success in, a, in the studio would mean. And I realized that it was this moment when you had something that's looking back at you. Mm -hmm. um, and 
so putting them up, they look, you know, I can start to, they start to look back at me, right? They're, they're something that's starting to evolve. Um, but I do um, take images of them upside down or um, in my old studio, I would always see them reflected in the mirror, in the window as a mirror. Um, hmm. So, yeah, but there, it's also an interesting question because there's spatial realities that I'm trying to, to um, create in the sense of how something reflects in a mirror and that it lines up in a particular way to be convincible, convincing. And um, the way that I work, I don't think about that. I'm just, draw, I'm just trying to pick up everything that I see and that at a certain point I have to make that, if I've made an error in something, it really, I'm like, wait, that doesn't make sense. And I, I can only see that when I've got a distance from it, when it's up on the wall. Mm -hmm. All right. Great. What other questions do you guys have? Can I ask a question, Jillian? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, I hope this question isn't too big, Shoshana, um, but I'm just really curious how, how you would answer it. And I'm wondering like if you have, like given what you've been invested in in your work, if you have like a more personalized definition of, of either painting and or abstraction, like what those terms specifically mean to you? Because I feel like if we asked everyone, people would probably have, I mean, you know, we'd have like 20 different definitions maybe. Yeah. So I'm curious, like how do you define those terms for yourself? Like what's the, what are the qualities that, that make up those things? Um, that's a great question. Um, I'm going to take a stab at, at answering, you know, how I, how I sort of categorize abstraction before I talk about how I might categorize, you know, something as in painting. Um, I was an abstract painter for a really long time and many people would look at this work and think that I am an abstract painter. Um, and the object that I created while it lives in the, you know, while it's something that exists in the real world, it was, it was constructed for purely, you know, metaphysical, contemplative, abstract purposes. So um, I think, I think the word, I'm interested in, in how um, they're like abstraction and realism are in this kind of dialectical tension. Um, but I think that, that it's, it's very hard to call something definitively abstract or, or not. Um, but for me, when I hear abstract painting, I immediately think about the New York School and ABEX and the kind of you know, in, intense ideals and aspirations and the anxiety. And that, that is the, that's my jumping, you know, that's my, my point of entry into painting is that. And it was, you know, I've, I've discovered much more but um, you know, it was de Kooning um, that I wanted to, that brought me to, that made me really want to be a painter. So um, of course there's a lot more to abstraction than that, but when I'm talking about abstraction for me, most of the time that's what I'm referring to. So with painting, um, I think one of the things that I look at and, and I, I think about this as a teacher and working with grad students and undergrad students, and of course, um, tons of friends who are working and call their work painting that has no paints really in it or is relief or sculpture. I guess it, to me, if it has some sort of relationship to the history of painting, um, you know, and, and it, that's in some way that that's, um, that that relationship to the history is accounted for, like the, the maker is accountable for that, that, um, Again, because I think painting has such a history of aspiration, right? And that's the site that I'm coming to. So that's my stab at it. <laughs> that Thank you. Thank you. You've talked about like the meaningfulness like that a series gives like work and like 
at what point do you feel like the work starts defining like what you're doing rather than you defining the work and like is it like a give and take or like at what point do you ever realize do you feel like your work is going to like take control of your like does that make sense yeah that's a great question i mean that's exactly what happened to me with that last drawing i was showing you where um i was reading this this book and um i realized that even though i was drawing from this setup directly you know nothing was different i was looking at this thing and translating the setup of the mirrors and the tape and the box but actually i saw myself very like within a week of the drawing realizing that it was incredibly associative of this crucifixion image you know and um you know because my mind was in this other was taking in this other kind of um, research or thinking or expansion and um the work definitely i mean it was in a the work took over you know i was you know it, it seems very like um all kind of woo woo to say like you know i'm an i'm an instrument of the work but i right i do kind of think that um i i was often in the in the first few years of it very surprised by what the paintings were doing i didn't feel i didn't feel like i knew what i was doing i felt like i the paintings knew what they were doing um i still feel like that too but you get you gain more control over what you're doing and you gain more you know it's just like you're accruing all this experience with being an artist and with being a human being and you start to understand a lot more than you started out with um you know but um there is definitely something that you know all along and it's not it doesn't you don't realize you knew it until much later the recognition of knowing something, um, cat, you, you catch up with yourself. Does Thank that you. answer your question? Yeah. Yes. I have one more question, if that's okay. <laughs> um, so, you, you, I mean, I know that you do normally uh, do your drawings or paintings in the series. Uh, don't you think it's like, and I know you, you probably do enjoy this series of work better because as you did mention, it's a, it's a commitment. Um, don't you think that just makes you limited? Cause that's how I feel when I have to paint a series of painting. I feel like we're limited. Um, I want to know how you feel about it. Um, thank you. I, mm -hmm. I think that limitations, um, are things to push into that they actually, um, you know, like teaching remotely, for example, rather than um, um, bemoaning what I've lost, you know, to teaching my students remotely, I'm, I've designed it so that I actually like really invest in what is available for me, um, you know, and, and I really work with the, the virtual. And I'm even in this presentation thinking about how the mirror surface is how, is it an equivalent to digital virtuality, right? And um, so limitations are, um, I can understand why when, if you're, if you're um, you know, at a, at a younger, you know, a fresher part of your, of your experience making things that it could feel very limiting to repeat yourself, but it also makes you an authority with what you're doing. And it's, um, it, it, I, I feel like limitations can be so expansive, right? If you set up rules, um, there's so many ways that you can invest in those, in those, in that, in that set of rules, right? It's like, I always use this analogy of putting on a glove and really pushing into all five fingers all the way, not just a little bit, but like really getting in there and really knowing and really being fully, fully present, which I, I definitely am. Um, but I think it's a personality, you know, I really do. I have that, you know, running on the treadmill kind of tenacious personality. And um, I admire so much my friends who are much more spontaneous 
you know, and can, um, I need, I need time in my studio. I need an hour to really work and build something. I, I, I'm envious of my friends who just go, Psh, you know, and they've done something genius and amazing. And then they can come back the next day. So it's personality and, um, you know, you find who you are. So don't, Thank if you're you. not that person, then don't be that person. Thank you. Sure. Looking at lots of faces, hoping for some questions. Uh, I, I have one. Cool Great. Um, uh, you were talking early, earlier. Let me take these out. <laughs> Uh, okay. You were talking earlier about um, like the truth and rendering forms and also two dimensional space. Um, and I was just wondering, I've been thinking about the reading you had us uh, from Annie Dillard. And she talks at, at one point um, toward the ends about like she would wake up bleary eyed and she would like experience that flatness that she could only imagine that those people who had like, you know, recently been given sight and how they could see um, she was just, you know, and the color patches and the flatness and, and is that something that like resonates with you or you like to try to like incorporate or think about when you're working? I don't know <laughs> if it makes sense. You know, I, it's, it's a great question also. Um, I think that I'm so absorbed in, in that, um, sorry, this prompt comes up every time I come back to talking to you guys. Um, um, I feel like I'm so, um, enacting and, and already living in that space that I don't have to think about it. Um, I think of that text as that text that it's not a text, it's a journey, that writing, uh, I mean, I don't think anybody can be that attentive all the time. It's almost like a child, you know, like that's what a child is. And, and even a child gets exhausted and has to go take a nap when they do <laughs> that for, um, but I, I love that section that you're talking about where she brings in this kind of, um, you know, scientific research, uh, to show, um, you know, who, who we are as, as visual and cognitive creatures. Um, does that answer? I, I'm not sure what you're, if, if I've answered a question or if there was more to the question. That, that was kind of it. Just like incorporating those those ideas and like what that means i guess um while while you're working no, i don't know <laughs> um it means it means that there's a lot of um it's 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 that i'm i'm so i'm so quiet and focused i'm so i mean i've had i've i've worked at like in tandem with friends who would you know they'd be in one studio i'd be and they'd come by and they'd be like, I thought you were dead because you haven't moved for, you know, an hour. You're in the exact same position. Um, you know, and it's, I've, I've built that, right? Like I've learned how to move my seat so that I'm not like sitting like this, looking at something. Um, but there's this kind of um, intense connection and engagement um, with a singular part, right? Like I'm not sort of all over the place with it. I go very, um, very deeply with with each part that I'm looking at, I guess. Um, thank you. Thank you. Hope you answered. Um, I have a question. So um, you said that your work is all about all like in an effort to point to the space where content is made or where content can be made in a painting or you know a work so it's not about it's not necessarily like you putting something in the container it's about pointing to the space where something could be put have you ever like considered doing like a series or I don't know some works where you are specifically putting something in the container like you're choosing rather than just calling attention to this space, but you're feeling it. Um, I, um, I think that I am. <laughs> I think that there is something in this space. It's immaterial. 
um, and I'm trying to materialize it. And it's the thing that I'm trying to materialize is, is, is in fact that potential. Um, not, um, I don't want to, I get very weary of, I mean, I know that I can name that potential, but it goes off into very romantic, lofty words, you know, like hope and yearning and belief. And I have to, you know, I just, I just want to talk about that potential. Um, again, like if you think about Piero, that they feel protected. Um, I, I remember standing in front of paintings and feeling like I found where I, where I come from, you know, like a sense of belonging and um, something larger than myself. And, um, you know, I grew up, I grew up Jewish and in a kind of religious, uh, institutional way of thinking, not necessarily from me, but it was the, what the world that I grew up in. And so I have a kind of relationship to, to cast the, the imagery of, the, of Christianity that's uh, both an outsider, you know, but an outsider not from a critical place, an outsider from a place of awe and trying to understand this um, system of thinking that has meant so much for the, the world that I know. Um, and has defined like the sort of the moral imagination of my life. Um, and so I guess I'm just trying to, um, to, to carry that forward, you know, and to, it, it's not about ego, like I can make something transcendent and I wanna give you a transcendent experience. I wanna give you evidence of somebody still believing in that. You know, at, at the same time as sort of knowing that it's also just a surface, it's also just a, a lot of material, and it, I might be failing, right? And, I, and inevitably, I am failing because not, you know, not, um, I'm only gonna, gonna mean that, it's only gonna mean that for a certain amount of people. I'm not gonna convince the whole world. Um, so I like what you're suggesting, and I think I'm gonna, um, I think, not so much that I would do what you're saying, but like what that, how you, how you get to that type of thinking is really interesting to me. But I do feel like I'm not, I'm not leaving it empty. Um, it's filled with conversation between different realities, right? Like the reality of the, of the mirror, the reality of, of how the tape reflects on something else. There's all these conversations going on. Um, it's not an empty space. I don't see it as empty. I want to ask a question, but I really don't know if it like if it's going to make any sense. But you brought up Rothko earlier, and um, I am like obsessed with the chapel here in Houston. Um, Say that again. The chapel, the Rothko chapel that we have yeah. here in Houston. I don't know if you've ever experienced it, but I haven't yet. <laughs> really? Oh my God. I, oh my God. Oh, and then maybe I my know, question I, won't I, make it as much sense as I'd like it to. I will go one day. Yeah, when I this? would hope, I would hope. It's a, it's an amazing, amazing place. But um, I guess when, when you were talking, when you were referencing Mark Rothko, um, and I, don't, I, I really don't know if this question is going to make any sense. But um, when, for me personally, the reason that I am so attracted to those paintings in particular is because I, oh, this is gonna sound so silly. I believe that because the paintings are like trapped in this like uh, concrete area that they have absorbed all of what has existed in that space. So I don't know if you know this, but the Rothko Chapel is one of the few places in Houston that allowed to have, um, uh, funerals for people with AIDS. So they had a lot of funerals at mm. that time. Um, so they'd seen death. We have the largest cancer center in the United States. So people who went there have gone there to pray a lot. You know, it's, it's a place that's seen weddings. It's seen people that walked in pregnant, people with joy, people with sadness. So I guess, I, I guess I just wanted your opinion on whether or not you believe that spaces have, or paintings have the potential to gain that energy and ex exert it back out onto the viewer. Does that make sense? Totally makes sense. And I'm um, like, just like, almost like um, crying from what you're saying. And I'm really thankful to get this information and I'm gonna research that. 
Um, I would recommend I, it for sure. Yeah, no, I mean, I love that you, um, I, I love that the way of thinking about, um, I mean, I, I would say that the, in the same way, I think I was just saying to, to Bailey about um, what I see in this, in the thing that I'm, the setup that I'm creating, which gets transformed into my paintings or becomes sort of this, you know, the, the, um, I want to use like the, the way, I feel like the, the setup sort of um, three dimensionalizes the inside of a painting. Right. That sounds very prescriptive, so I don't really, really fully mean that, but there is something like I made the box as a three dimensional version of the two dimensional painting. Um, and I'm inside of it trying to look around and that's what the mirror does and it has all these conversations. But um, I'm, I'm astounded that, I, that we do really, really project um, our, 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 our lives, the things that we're thinking about, the things that we're, I like to think of reaching to understand, that all, that all gets infused. I mean, this, this drawing that I made this summer, I was really like, you know, how weird that it was a crucifix, which is also like this kind of, you know, has historically been um, the sign of a miracle, right? Like you see, you know, uh, a, a vision of, of the Virgin Mary, right? Like these, these signs, and, and it felt like that to me. And I'm not, it has nothing to do with me being, um, you know, somebody special. It just means that I was in a space where I was, my, my awareness was really heightened. I was really close to myself and my thinking. And I was deeply caring about both the drawing and what I was reading about. And so that, that was the transfiguration. That's what coalesced into that drawing. So. I absolutely, I mean, I'm, I, I, that Pierre, those Pierre de la Francesca's hold all of that, you know, um, I, I do really, you know, their painting is flesh. It's, it just, yeah, it's, it's made from alchemy, the minerals in the ground. Um, so that's all in there. I mean, I couldn't, right. I, I couldn't speak very eruditely about this. I can just sort of sound like I am. <laughs> by throwing out words like alchemy and all of that, but I, I, I agree. Yes, I do believe that. But I think that um, we have to be really careful, of, careful about believing that because we're in a world that um, needs us to believe and also needs us to be empirically convincing at the same time. And so, um, you know, faith and doubt together. Totally, cool. Thank you so much for that response. Thank you. Uh, hi, uh, I'd be really interested to hear uh, like what portion of your day is like personal and like professional development? Like what portion of your day is just sitting down and doing art? Mm. It varies week by week. Um, I, um, you know, over and over the years, it's totally changed. So I'll just talk about like right now. Um, we are in, you know, pandemic, and I have a school aged child um, who is remote learning, you know, in eighth grade. And uh, when school started in September, I have a fairly large studio. I set him up here because I needed to be able to watch what he was doing, I, I, aka not being on Minecraft, right? And um, it was very disruptive towards sort of establishing, you know, concentration. So I changed that plan. Um, but we've had a snow day yesterday. And uh, I mean, I feel like I'm, I'm always trying, I'm, I've never have enough time in my studio, never have enough time. Um, my family is always yelling at me because I'm coming home for dinner late. And now my studio is down the block and they thought that I, that would change things. It still hasn't changed things. Um, so I lose track of time. And, um, but, but, but at the same time, the remote learning is also great because I'm teaching out of my studio, right? So I don't have to commute and I can put something aside and start teaching or just, it, it's, it's all sort of combined together. But the larger thing is also just that there's very little differentiation for me between my personal life and my professional life. Um, 
it's all, you know, and that, that wasn't always true. And that was something that had to be cultivated as I got older to feel more comfortable with my identity as an artist and like believing in myself and, you know, not having kind of compartmentalized lives where you're friends with certain people who don't really get you as an artist and friends with, right? So, um, yeah. Cool, thank you. I have a question. Um, do you ever work outside of your studio? You might have mentioned it a little bit, but um, do you ever work like outside or at parks or anything like that and then bring it back into your studio? Or do you just focus on being in that space? Great question. Um, I, uh, because I teach, right? I have my summers, like, you know, these long summers and um, I can go places, I can go to residencies, I can go visit people and I would bring stuff to work with and um, make stuff in, in natural, like in the natural world, right? So I might, um, uh, yeah, so, so there's, always, there's always the possibility of different things that can come into the, into the work. It tends to focus on mirrors still, you know, and elements that are in the still life, the pieces of the acetate, pieces of the tape, pieces of the mirror. Um, but I'm absolutely not, um, um, conf like I'm not limited where I work. I can take myself anywhere and, and get into it. And um, I wasn't always sure of that, um, but that's another thing that I sort of, you know, tested out for myself over the years and become acclimated to it. So I feel very, um, you know, fluid like that. Um, I'm not very interested in, in, in drawing like foliage. <laughs> um, I'm interested in seeing what I want to see. So like I might draw a glass of water. Um, I like drawing, you know, if I'm with my my friends and family, I might like to draw them, them, their faces, you know, I love, I love just looking and trying to figure out forms. Um, so there's some of that. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Doug. This might be a really dumb question, um, but okay, I'm trying to figure out how to word it. Okay, um, when you're when you're working on something, okay. So when I'm working on a painting and I I'm like kind of halfway in, like I've spent time working on it, and it feels like it's just not working, and I'm really frustrated. I'm really quick to just scrapping it and giving up on it and just moving on to something else. So if you're working on something and you and you feel like just something's not working are you the kind of person that you know s sees it through and you know alters things about it or do you just if something's not working you stop and you redirect and do something else i know it's dumb i'm sorry <laughs> that's not dumb at all that's not dumb at all it's a great question and you know what i'm here for these kinds of questions like for you guys to mirror you know to to sort of see who you are in relationship to who, who i am like that's that's I think really what I'm here for. here for. Oops, I just now I have that thing happening. I'm gonna shut off shut off my phone. Yeah. Okay. Um We can't hear you. You can't, okay. Um, sorry, there's just things jumping up. Here we go, okay. Um, so I always get to a point in my painting where it's not working. Like that always happens. And I'm in bad mood, a really bad mood. <laughs> it always happens. And every time it happens, I'm like, why is this happening? And my husband has to say, this always happens, right? You forget, you know, um, but I am 
and always have been. I'm the person that wrestles a painting to the ground. It's part of that tenacity. It's part of my personality. Um, I don't think it's 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 not a it's it's not a good thing or a bad thing. It just is who I am. Um, you know, but I will say, like, you know, over the years, I've destroyed a lot of work that I thought, you know, that was that was important to keep at the time, but then, you know, cut it up garbage. Um, but I but because I'm also working with something that's really guiding the paintings, I don't have to because I'm looking at something which is an amazing thing because I can just and this goes back to the question about limits. It's like I have these rules and I have these boundaries. And so I don't have to think about anything except making a painting, you know, um, and figuring it out and, and sticking with it. But I'm in full support of throwing something in the garbage and starting all over again and not being precious and not feeling, you know, like you have to be committed to something. That's like, you know, the flip side of it. it you shouldn't be um, obliged unless you unless that's part of what you want. Thank you. Thank you. It's so helpful because it's really, I love, it's never occurred to me to just say, um, getting frustrated and wanting to quit always happens in a, when I'm making a work of art. And yet it is absolutely true. I've just never like fully ad admitted it as clearly as you just did. And so it's such a relief. Like once you know that's, that always happens, well, okay, then that, and, and then keep going. Right. 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 Even as, as painful as it is. Right. And you're like, I, I just, I can't paint or, you know, I've made a mess or, you know, I mean, part of what I do in my work, I talked a little bit about, um, maybe I didn't, but uh, something I learned in graduate school, which somehow I had never been taught this, was that, you know, you can paint and you can use a razor blade to, um, to take the paint away, right? So it's a kind of erasing. So right next to my, um, you guys can see me, right? Yeah, yeah. right next to my, um, uh little brushes are these exactos right and i scratch away um and you know reclaim a, a spot that has to have more light in it um i i hate i really i'm, I'm sort of anti-white paint i'm anti-opacity so i use the white of the ground of the canvas to to create a sense of light and so if i need to you know change the edge of a piece of tape that it's not sitting correctly this is how i do it um and so what happens is that um i have all these little crumbs of paint on the surface of my paintings from like scraping it and not getting it fully off and um when i'm trying to make this perfect little line and i i am blind to see this little crumb of paint it totally messes up my line. And so I'll get stuck in places like that where I can't do what I'm trying to do because I've already, you know, scarred the surface in this way. So, you know, it's all, it's really, it's generally technical. Um, you don't think of it as technical, but it's, uh, th that maybe that's just an example of one of the ways in which I'm like, you know, just really get really frustrated and I just feel like I've ruined everything. Um, this yeah. might be a bit of an odd question but so you talked about like how like your painting and like the scale like like large scale like correlated with like ego and like the small scale correlated like with you being more like focused on a small thing how does like your persona like and as a person like being an artist like in your career like maintaining a character or not maintaining a character do you feel like you have a pressure to be a certain act a certain way be a certain way to like do what you do oh yeah <laughs> i mean you know to i i think of you know people who aren't artists as lay people right and they're um they're they're they rarefy artists you know they they think that we're um you know, really 
either really strange, you know, and how can we cope with all the um, instability of being an artist, but we're also so talented. And I don't think, you know, for me, I'm, I don't think of myself as talented. I think of myself as, to use that word again, like I just keep going, right? I'm just tenacious and I built what I built because I wanted to. So I, I really feel like there's desire to do something and there's different than talent. Um, but, you know, I mean, you're asking a really enormous question also that has to do with uh, success in the art world, because you definitely, just like with, with any um, public, uh, something that deals with public relations, you have to present something in the world that's, that's maybe a little bit more packaged than who you actually are. Um, I've never been perfect with that um i am very I, i'm i live in a place of like needing to feel authentic and so um you know my i think my persona when i maybe was younger was different from the persona that i am now and my work when i was younger was different from what, what i am now but i think that there's an intensity to my work and there's an intensity to me that um are in sync with each other um but it it's it's like you have to have that that um that elevator uh what is it the elevator uh set pitch the elevator pitch right like the you know you're in the you're in the room with mark rothko you're in the elevator with mark rothko what are you going to say right <laughs> um so that maybe is sort of what you're talking about a little bit like that different um persona um but I'll just say also, like, I, I feel incredibly vulnerable as an artist. Um, and at the same time, this feeling like I'm so who I am. And I've been given all of these wonderful ways to keep being an artist, one of which is teaching, right? Because teaching really um, just is, you get to live in the world of, of, of thinking and making and that doesn't really exist in, in the rest of the world. Thank you. Shoshan, I want to be um, respectful of your time and it's getting to be um, 5.30 your time and probably your family's going to wonder where you are for dinner. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so early for dinner. They're not expecting me, trust me. But <laughs> Forget it. Let's keep going. <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, maybe if there's one more question, we can do that and then close I guess I, I also just want to, ho I hope that I'm answering questions as the artist in the studio. I know that I, I um, relied a lot on, um, um, you know, a, a shared screen to show the images. Um, I, if there's any questions about that, that pertain to being in the studio and I mean, they've all been that, but uh if you guys have any questions about that um if you want to see my studio a little bit more i can move my computer around um i, I would like to ask you if you like i notice through your practice that um i have how can i say this but do you read at all, a lot of our history oh yeah i i can see that in in the materials and just like the beauty of the painting and yeah i mean i i i i always have loved art history um um and it's this great i mean one of the things that i love well this is sort of like a thing to love about being a human being but it's also about being an artist is that you go through different periods of like you only care about these this type of work you know and then a few years later you're over that and you really love this type of work and um another thing that i love about being a human being and getting you know older and stuff is that you actually really start to um accumulate knowledge and so art history is this huge vast thing but i've i've found that i i I never really understood Renaissance painting. I wasn't interested. My mind went towards abstraction and Agnes Martin, Mark Rothko, minimalism, all this stuff. And at the sort of beginnings of this body of work, um, I really started focusing on easel painting and Renaissance painting and really learning a huge amount of it and reading all the time. 
um, and reading more than about the artist, but but uh, from art historians. Um, and I, yeah, I do. I love art history. Are you also saying, Shoshana, that you're reading art history from the perspective of like, like the question? You're reading it not because it was assigned in a class, but because it's actually something you want to know about for your painting. So you're kind of reading it like from that kind of hunger. Oh yeah, but I'm I'm not reading it because I want to know about it even from my painting. I'm reading it because I'm just hungry for it. Yeah, yeah. Like the way you would binge on something for net on Netflix, right? Like I, I mean, it, and it's not just art history. It's I read a lot about. Um, uh, um, belief and religion. Um, my my um, holiday present was um, this huge tome um, by a historian of religion named Mircea Eliade, um, A History of Religions, and it's just volume one. <laughs> and like ecstasy, ecstatic, like I couldn't wait to devour it. Um, you become, I mean, again, I was never like that. When I was your age, this was not who I was at all. I don't know how old you guys are, but when I was in college or in graduate school, I was not formed in this way. I was still like, there were so many different things. I was overwhelmed, but more and more, you know, I've been um, just like geeking out into particular things and really, um, you know, really, really absorbed in particular uh trajectories of thinking and, and research. Um, but the interest in art history also is because of um, feeling a, a, a lack in contemporary painting. Um, you know, feeling, which isn't a, a criticism to my peers or a, that there, but just um, I, I wanted to look elsewhere. So, so I relate much more to history then I relate to contemporary painting. Um, I mean, I'm, there's a lot of contemporary painting I'm in love with. I, I you know, there's a lot, but um, my context is towards art history, if that makes sense. Do you ever read in the studio or when you come to the studio, is it like, I am only here to paint and that's it? And I will not oh, okay, so that's a, another like, the reading, so when I was talking about reading that book this summer and making that drawing, I was reading it in the studio. And um, I'll take you guys over here. Like I always, um, I can't see my, my image, but you can see that there's like white paper underneath the table. Mm -hmm. Can you guys see that? So I always have um, my tables covered with white paper. Hmm? Just one more time, because I have you on big screen now. For the um, that there's just like this white paper. Does that? Got it. Um, so I, I will read and I'll write things on the on the paper. Um, so I don't know why I don't see myself in here. What did I do? Let me just see if I can. We can. See I did that hide see. self you, but maybe you can see that there's. Oh wow! Uh, wow. Yeah. So these are. This is all from the book that I was reading this summer. So I I write all over. Oop. It's blurry, but were those all just like scrap pieces of paper with pencil? Okay. Right. So it was, I cut up the paper. I, I, I was in a different studio and um, I took my paper, rolled it up with me, and um, I then started to cut it up, all the important things. And it's, it's under this, right now there's clean paper on top of paper that's all written it. So I read in the studio, absolutely. Um, I mean, I also read at home, but it's, more about here and I write things down. I've always been a journal writer, so I write into my journal. It's, um, you know, I, I collect what other people are saying about painting or about religion. You know, I'm just collecting stuff all the time. And I, I really, um, I, feel, I feel often frustrated that, um, that there's so much that we think about and how we can get it out of our heads and into the world and share it. Um, but there's a lot that I think about in the work and um, you know, art history and what, what those paintings meant for people. 
um, who the audience was, who my audience could possibly be, um, all, all the things I care about. Um, mm -hmm. I don't read fiction. I read nonfiction. You know that, Jillian, right? I didn't really. I actually, <laughs> now that you say it, now I'm remembering it, but I'm, I'm shocked all over again. Okay. <laughs> you read poetry? I do. I was just going to say, except for poetry, okay. which I, you know, I don't know if you would call that fiction, but yeah, I do read poetry. Do you have a favorite poet? Um, I, I really love Emily Dickinson. Um, who else? My sister is a poet, um, so I kind of like her, her work. Um, she's a, a, very much a confessional poet, um, so it's a little intense. She's more intense than I am. Um, I have lots of poet friends, so I, I feel obliged to say they're, they're some of my favorites, like Monica de la Tour. Um, I loved that interview you did with her. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that was a really, really good interview. Yeah, that was fun. That was a long time ago. Now that we talk about poet, when you paint or you do any artwork, do you listen to any music? Or, mm. um, or is it always um, silent? <laughs> no, it's not. It's, it's, it can be silent. Um, I've always listened to music. Um, I've gotten into the habit of listening to podcasts a lot. Um, and um, they tend to be, um, you know, either political or um, semi-spiritual in the sense of, you know, philosophical spiritual. Um, I love listening to music, though. It's just that you can never um, have enough good music. Like, it, that takes a lot of work, and I don't have the time to always collect the good music. So I forget that I have good music, and then I just get into podcasts and, yeah. Do you bring your lunch? <laughs> you know, food is such a problem. Um, I used to, since I've been in this studio, because we've been in this pandemic, right? You don't want to go out to get lunch. So I have been bringing lunch. Um, but I tend to skip food for lunch. And then I get yelled at because I've skipped lunch. <laughs> um, and then I'm an animal when it comes to eating dinner. But um, <laughs> yeah, I have a little fridge. I even have a little microwave. It's the only microwave I've ever had in my life. So I'll bring something. And I had some soup earlier. Great. Um, I drink a lot of water. Um, I used to chew gum like incessantly. I had to stop doing that because it's really bad for your teeth. I have a question. When you have a show that comes up, um, how is your process different? Like, what is your studio like? Or, or is it full of pieces that you're choosing between? What does that look like? Oh, it's, it's, that's a good, good question. Because I actually am um, getting ready, not for a show of paintings, but actually a show that's an installation of um, a setup. So I'm going to be showing, you know, sort of, sort of composing a sculptural installation with my mirrors and my boxes and um i'm i'm very much thinking about i think i've spoken to jillian a little bit about it i I'm really want to show that the the setup itself is not the work that it's what generates work um but i will be creating a mock-up here of the the space and and sort of setting that up um which is often, you know, whenever I've had to do sort of site specific things, which goes back to earlier work, I make it in the studio and it either directly translates into the space or it's like a trial for the space and I perform, uh, produce it um, again on site. Um, when I've showed work, um, it's usually I'm, I'm working with a curator or a gallerist, right? So it's a conversation and they're making us, we're making a selection together. Um, but because I have all these um, 
little paintings and I've got, I'll, maybe I'll come bring you guys over very quickly to my area where, um, do you guys see my shelves? Yeah. And these, so each one of the paintings lives inside its own box, right? So the meta thing continues. Um, there are archival boxes that um, are, are um, for them to be stored because also the surfaces, because they have so much wax in the, in the surface, they're very, very delicate and they can't really be um, uh, wrapped and they can't sit this way. So they each have their own little box. So when I'm having a studio visit, it's like I'm sending out looks on the runway kind of, like I'm bringing out and, you know, running around the school, not running, but, you know, changing the, the, um, what's on the wall. And inevitably when the studio visit is over there, like the studio is just completely, you know, there's tons of paintings sitting on the, like leaning and looking at you from the floor and there's stuff all over the wall. So, um, there's a lot of going through and making relationships, but I, I like to have, um, a lot of space around each of my paintings. Um, contrary to that first image that I showed you of a salon style, I really like them to have their own, a lot of space. Even my drawings, just a lot of space. So, um, yeah. Thank you. Thanks, you guys, for Thank all you. of your questions. And mm -hmm. um, I hope you've, I hope that my presentation here sort of just um, strengthens feelings about yourself, you know, that you're, that you're okay, right? And that it's all, um, it's all a process and uh, yeah, and worth it. Totally. Thank you. Thank you, Shoshana. Such a generous studio visit. Thank you for answering all of our questions from lunch. <laughs> Um, here and <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a whole gamut of important questions. So thank you. That was a trick question, right? The lunch one. <laughs> not like I, lunch is super important. Like where it's, you can't, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you.